I feel the need to add a disclaimer to this video given some of the subject and materials. I like the clans, and this video is not meant to be an attack on them. The bluntness of which I speak of some of the concepts that are talked about in this video is to drive forward some of the ideas around them and their society, as well as to show why clans often fill the role of aliens within Battletech and antagonists. While I argue that the clans are questionably human in their behavior as we would likely define it in many ways, or that they impose a forced society on people which strips them of their humanity, this doesn't mean people who like them, or play them, are in any way like them. The clans as a whole are a great part of Battletech. Just to be clear, I played word bearers in Warhammer 40,000, and I have clan forces for Battletech. And I love both. It's just fiction, and this video is delving into that. That's all. What is it to be a human being? It's an interesting question, and one which truthfully won't be completely answered by the end of this video, even if I have my own opinion on it. But it's an interesting thing to start with as it relates to the topic of this video which you've opted to click on. What makes someone a human physically? What makes someone a human spiritually, or even, dare I say, culturally? Would someone born without parents and raised without a family meet all of these qualifications? And if not, in what sense wouldn't they or would they? Would someone whose genes are edited significantly, so they no longer resemble a typical human being, fall into the same category? These questions aren't meant to be asked without sincerity. People forget that what makes us what we are comes from a multitude of things. So, in this video, a video about the most recognizable battle troops in the entirety of Battletech, the Clan Elementals, we are going to have to explore just how they came about. And we have to explore at least a little bit of what some of that might entail, given the society that made them. Clan Elementals are a major component of the ground forces of the clans during their invasion of the Inner Sphere in 3039 and forward, and prior to this participated in clan trials and conflicts on the clan homeworlds region after their development. It is odd to say development, as it is implied more that Clan Elementals may be some kind of specialist who is trained over time into a specific role, or might be some type of weapon system. But that's not really how it works. Or how clan society's extreme eugenics policies, or its caste system, works. I know this is going to be very unpopular to say, but the clans are fundamentally a break from much of humanity's history, and almost all of Terran originated life's existence prior to their creation. Nicholas Kerensky, the father of the clans, had a firm belief in eugenics policies as well as state-encouraged martial competition in order to determine that the most fit would become the heads of the warrior caste. This was pushed onto this caste in order to create what Nicholas perceived as the strongest society possible. Kerensky also appeared to want to remove, quote, tainted, unquote, attributes from his warriors over time. The eugenics program was extended to the society as a whole in some ways, impacting the labor caste, technician caste, science caste, merchant caste, and, of course, the warrior caste. In the case of civilians, spouses would be selected based off of genetic compatibility, or at least screened for it. Sometimes, after Kerensky's death in particular, many scientists would look the other way when couples met. But one thing that was very important to Kerensky was the desire to remove the family from the equation of society though the Ghost Bears would retain this in their own unique traditions. Parents are more than sometimes distanced from their children who are raised more communally to break or add division to this connection, and the cast members themselves of each clan are viewed as property of said clan, rather than citizens. Offspring are encouraged amongst clan civilians in order to expand the economy and industrial base, and if one doesn't bribe someone to select their spouse, a spouse will be selected for them regardless. A deliberately callous contempt for elders in society is also placed on clan society, 
where even among civilians, anyone over a certain age is deliberately denied certain services or medicine, even if it is readily available, with civilians in the labor caste on average not living to see their 60s, while merchants and technicians typically don't see 70, and scientists live on average a little bit into their 70s. The denial of resources to elders in society, such as medical interventions, even when they are bluntly available, is a major contributor to this. The old aren't valued by the clans, at least those who aren't in the warrior caste, and more specifically, who have received blood names. Because warriors who do not receive such an honor don't typically live to see 50. This is a part of the culture of social Darwinism and eugenics that is imposed on the clan way of life. The warrior caste takes things a step further than what the civilians experience, however, and removes the parents from the equation altogether. Instead, warriors are grown with a device called an iron womb, using genetic material typically from two donors, which is often edited beforehand to remove the real or perceived flaws or imperfections in their children's genetics. These children are grown in batches and are born into the world. These crops of children are placed into a Sibco. In some clans, the entirety of a Sibco are genetic siblings and are raised together. And in other clans, they mix the batches before creating the Sibcos officially. Individuals born of this have no true family outside of the Sibco themselves and are considered true born warriors. They are raised without a family, even more so than the free birth civilian caste children and deliberately so, all while being placed in fierce competition with one another. In the trials that will come for their warriors as they progress through life, it is likely some will not meet the criteria to become soldiers of any sort and will be placed into the civilian castes, something which is a great shame for a trueborn warrior to have to accept, as they are raised to believe in their society that being a warrior is the highest honor possible. It also means they will be forever excluded from having the honor of a blood name and simply become normal civilians. Others will be killed in trials and competitions that take place between one another, sometimes being killed by their literal siblings. This isn't always wanted, but these challenges can be dangerous to one another, whether it be in training or full real trials of position, both official and unofficial. In this, the children, teenagers, and young adults are not taught the kinds of emotional support or traditions that most humans throughout history have. They lack some of the features people on Earth today know, or they have no words to express the sensations they may feel in many respects, or fear displaying them, or giving off signs of weakness. As a result, things like love, or companionship as we understand it, as well as a multitude of other very human qualities and traits, often don't appear naturally among clan warriors unless they are heavily exposed to human beings otherwise. But we can see, such as in novels all the way up until the Dark Ages, where clanners regularly interact with humans from the inner sphere, that they are naive to these traits still within many of their organizations, even ones that directly work with the inner sphere powers. In essence, clan warriors are unlike any person you could meet today. Every human being who has lived on Earth has parents, at least one. They might never meet them through an act of fate, or they might lose them at some point along the way. But they do have them. Beyond this, they have family that extends past this. Often uncles and aunts, siblings, cousins, grandparents, and an assortment of others. Family histories and generational knowledge are passed down through these families and cultures broadly grow around them as a result. While the clans do have cultures and do pass down knowledge of blood-named warriors from the past, it's still not connected with their descendants in the same way. Warriors supposedly gain great comfort from knowing they are descended from the chosen 800 blood-named warriors, hand-picked by Kerensky. But this seems to be all more propaganda of a cult, rather than a true sense of belonging or comfort. The true solace most can acquire is achieving glory and recognition. This is something they are consistently encouraged to seek for themselves throughout their entire lives. The only means of being remembered in their often short, violent lives 
is to have achieved enough to receive a blood name themselves, which ensures that their genes will be used in an upcoming Simcoe, and will ensure that their legacies are passed on. In a recent example of this, in Lethal Lessons, you can see how damaged most of these people are when they don't achieve the glory that they need in their lives. You can see how they are separated from true intimacy, or embracing real feelings of companionship, or their need to hide their grief. They are everything that Charlie Chaplin warns us about in his speech in The Great Dictator. They are the cattle he warned about, but worse, they have become the unnatural men themselves. Machine men with machine minds and machine hearts. More tragic yet, disputes are almost universally resolved through violence or combat trials of various sorts. This feeds the competitive, violent conditioning of the lives of these people as well. So, why all of this explanation and how does this relate to clan elementals? Because elementals did not exist with the founding of the clans. Elementals are not simply warriors with slightly edited genes, like mech warriors from the clans. They were built to be a part of a weapon system, specifically. They are engineered into what they are from the very start, and they were engineered by the society I've described just now in a broad sense. During the Golden Age of the Clans, referred to as the Golden Century, major advancements were made in clan space after the death of their founder, Nicholas Kerensky. These advancements were made mostly in the sciences, with the major element of this having a military focus, largely due to the clan's militaristic origins from the SLDF and from the culture which Nicholas Kerensky had imposed on the people prior to his death. Clan Omnimex would be developed, for instance, during the Golden Century, along with many of their more advanced and effective technologies for combat, such as higher damage lasers and PPCs, and significantly lighter autocannons and Gauss rifles. But during this, specifically Clan Wolf had been working on a new form of combatant for the battlefield. To keep up with the increasingly powerful and advanced battle mechs, it was determined by the wolves that infantry would need to advance as well, and would need to achieve similar dramatic advancements as their mech-based counterparts. They would begin work on battle armor designs for their bravest of infantrymen, meant to not only keep up with the battle mechs, but to survive engagements with them, and even having the firepower to damage or outright destroy mechs themselves. This differed from normal infantry in the sense of while foot infantry could achieve these goals, it required them often needing to ambush targets, and required dedicated soldiers filling specific roles to support the infantry, and it required a large volume of them at that. The battle armor in question, even at its earliest stages, was meant to mitigate these shortcomings. This, though, was one component of the overall catalyst that would create the iconic and recognizable unit and literal breed of human known as Elementals. During trials against Clan Novacat, the wolves would employ this armor to great effect, but it was watched by many. Of course, the other clans displayed an immediate interest, but none more than Clan Hell's Horses. The Hell's Horses were always strange by clan standards, insofar that they ignored the central piece of what made the clan military unique under the guidance of Nicholas Kerensky. Battle mechs were always meant to be the central focus of the clan military, with other assets really being subservient to that arm of the fighting forces. While this might have been true in the Hell's Horses as well, they focused heavily on the other components of warfare. Combined Arms Doctrine is the core of the Hell's Horses as a clan, and always has been. Tanks, VTOLs, air power, infantry and fighting vehicles, even things as taboo as artillery, all tend to be in sight for the ways of war for the Hell's Horses in a way other clans specifically neglect. As a result, before the invention and innovation of the new battle armor, they would engage in building the ultimate infantry. New genetic changes were experimented on in detail, and new traits were selected through this process to become a part of a new strain of warrior. Built from clan warrior stock originally, of course, allowing this new breed of infantry to still be related to the first 800 chosen warriors of Nicholas Kerensky. These warriors would be the basis for the elemental, 
and were even referred to in this way in the Crusader clan sourcebook in the events leading up to the spread of the technologies, both by the wolves and by the horses. This would start as a result of Clan Hell's horses and Clan Wolf challenging one another for their technologies over the course of three duels. Clan Hell's horses wanted the advanced battle armor of the wolves, and the wolves wanted the genetic information and breeding procedures for these new, devastating infantry. The decisions in the trials by combat resulted in the technologies being swapped between the two clans, with Wolf acquiring most of the information it needed and Hell's Horses acquiring the suits that they needed. And both sides gained enough that they were able to reverse engineer enough to create their own. From here, trials to these clans only further spread these secrets amongst the others, until the entirety of the clans were able to begin growing elementals and building new, advanced armor for them to pilot. From the time of this trial, which occurred in the latter half of the 29th century, it would change the face of infantry in the Kerensky Cluster. Infantry now could participate in battles with mechs on a much more even footing. In fact, teams of elementals would be so thoroughly absorbed into the clans that points of elementals would participate in trials against mechs even directly. But even with all of these virtues said, it's very rare for clan elementals to achieve high ranks within a clan, even after proving themselves more than capable on the battlefield as a leader. This is because, like almost every society, but especially in ones built around castes, like the clans, prejudice exists despite the protestations to the contrary. Clan mech warriors, those with the most influence within the warrior caste, view their elemental brethren as being only good for muscle and violence, and they believe that their elemental counterparts to be intellectually inferior even if subtly so. This prejudice is mostly unspoken, but it is pervasive. The most damning part about it is that it is obviously not true. When given opportunities, clan elementals have risen to any rank within their reach. Many are just simply denied those opportunities, and they are neither slow, dim-witted, or mentally reduced in any way. It is only that stereotype which keeps them in their place. And it's also likely that the mech warrior caste seeks to hold on to their power even subconsciously. Just like with other members of the warrior caste, not every trueborn clan warrior will end up passing their trials and becoming full-fledged members of their caste, or in other cases, they simply age out of being a standard battle armor soldier. In the case of the former, they will end up in the civilian castes, and they could fall into any of these castes depending on how they test. However, the most likely place they are to land due to a bias once more placed on their physical features is the labor caste, where their natural physical qualities will be put to use most readily. For soldiers who never achieved the status of a blood name and survived too long, they may end up washing out into the civilian castes themselves, but in many cases these soldiers will become standard Salhama infantry, or they will take up roles as marines aboard merchant vessels. In essence, their training and physical qualities will put them to use after they are done their normal service. Sadly, these services are considered to be lesser work by most trueborn clan warriors. But even then, there are those who will rise above this station. While it is rare for elementals to receive dramatic promotion beyond Star Commander, there have been instances of cons, or even ill cons, having risen above the prejudices set against them, such as the instance of Lincoln Osis, for example, a smoke jaguar who would become Ilkhan. Trueborn clan elementals are by their very nature entities which have been built for war using advanced genetic engineering. Everything about them is built to be the ultimate ground forces infantry, as well as being eventually the most effective battle armor combatant. Despite having thoughts, feelings, and the same attributes as any normal human, they are designed for war through and through, and are raised and conditioned for it. They stand 2 to 2.5 meters, or 6 foot 5 to 8 foot 2 in their height. They are also much heavier because they have significantly more muscle than a person would proportionately have meaning that their weight will also be increased over a normal human of the same stature. 
These qualities make them appear to be superhuman in these respects, but these are the primary divergences for elementals. So they might be as strong or stronger than a silverback gorilla, but they aren't on their own enhanced to such an extent that they would be able to punch through steel, for instance. Another important point which is often overlooked is the caloric intake for these individuals, and how it would be immense. Their enhanced size and weight would already demand higher volumes of food to keep them in good condition, but the truth is, is that all of that extra muscle on board also means that they would have even more nutrient requirements. Keeping elementals fed would be a costly venture for the state utilizing them for military purposes. As freed persons, civilian cast members, or exiles in other societies, Interestingly, this would be likely a major cost of the elemental derived people, just as a quick aside. Also, because of their genetics, and because they have literally been designed for it, they have a natural aptitude towards piloting battle armor. Both the pilot and their armor share the exact same name in a small way showing the dehumanization of the idea behind their very creation by the clans. But that is neither here nor there. The Elemental's battle suit's origins aren't truly with Clan Wolf, at least not in their entirety. It actually is stated that it started as an environmental diving suit created by Clan Goliath Scorpion to explore the oceans of the planet of Dagda. This non-combat suit contained myomer musculature, a self-contained air supply, and a heavy atmospheric life support system in order for the suit to survive the massive pressures of deep ocean environments. The wolves would just be the first to realize their combat potential. They were also originally developed into several shapes and sizes based on the potential environments that they would be put in for combat. These original different sizes were mostly discarded by the clans during the Golden Century, but some of these suits would later be revised in various ways for a new era of combat in the future, but would mostly not see development independently from the 29th century all the way through to the latter portions of the clan invasion in the 31st century. The original elemental battle armor, or elemental suit, is little different from the ones that saw service in the inner sphere. These suits use myomer musculature, self-contained life support systems, are atmospherically sealed, and have thick armored plating, as well as integrated jump jets and advanced weapon systems. This system would be updated finally in the years after the failed invasion of the Inner Sphere, but from the time of the Golden Century until the vicious battles of the clan invasion, it remained largely unchanged. To begin with, each elemental is armed with an arm-mounted small laser, which is staggeringly powerful as an infantry-scaled weapon against battle mechs or tanks. Alternatively, there are configurations that utilize a mech-based machine gun or a flamethrower to be mounted in place of the small laser. It also has a devastating anti-personnel machine gun installed into the left arm, which can do severe damage to enemy infantry at range. The most notable piece of gear is that it has a detachable SRM-2 pack, which has a total of two rounds of fire per missile tube. The latter has superb range for a unit like infantry or battle armor, and when used collectively, can land devastating volleys of missiles on heavy targets. They also have a battle claw to consider as well in the left arm, which is a horrifying dedicated melee tool, and one which can cause hardship for armored targets, and tragedy for unarmored ones. In terms of protection, each elemental suit can withstand a full 10 points of damage before it is, in essence, destroyed. There is an 11th damage required to kill the pilot, and so in total, 11 damage is necessary to down one of these targets and remove it from the field. In universe, these use a substance known as Hargel as a defensive attribute, which is a substance only used by the clans and is mostly monopolized in terms of its trade by Clan Seafox. This substance will fill damage gaps in the armor and potentially seal horrific injuries for the warrior within, saving their life, perhaps saving the armor, or allowing it to continue to operate effectively despite injuries or damage sustained on the battlefield. 
Each unit of elementals can either walk at one movement point per turn, as per infantry, or it can leap up to three movement points in a single bound, much like jump infantry. They also have the ability to ride on top of Omnimechs, as well as many armored personnel vehicles, giving them vastly increased movement speeds while in transportation. Originally, clan elementals were deployed with small lasers, machine guns, and temporary SRM systems in the rules, but these were changed with the game over time. The machine guns were downgraded to an anti-personnel infantry MG, which now uses the default auto rifle rules in game. The latter tends to remain unlisted on their record sheet as well, and must be referenced using the Total War rulebook. Battle armor benefits from many of the same abilities infantry have overall, but with a few notable exceptions. For instance, they are hard to kill outright, and most weapon damage doesn't pass on from one suit to the next while taking fire, but they don't benefit from reduced damage from incoming weaponry. So a Gauss Rifle's damage won't be siphoned away to 2 damage, and instead will deliver a catastrophic 15 damage to 1 suit, and that will literally split the elemental and their armor in 2, leaving behind shorn metal, oozing hargel, and unfortunately dispersed human remains. But they also benefit from things such as being able to perform leg attacks and swarm attacks, they also have a much higher, on average, anti-mech skill than most infantry, and it is by default even better than their inner sphere counterparts in their battle armor as well. This means when elementals make a move to swarm attack, or leg attack, not only will it typically be more brutal in the instance of the former, but it's just more likely to work overall. These attacks can leave battle mechs crippled or even outright destroyed. These close quarters attacks are even more powerful against mechs which are otherwise engaged or have been crippled in some way. Often, a single, fully armored, up to speed battle mech will still be able to outfight elementals by using their superior speed and weapons ranges to slowly whittle down these powerful armored infantry formations. But the truth is, these are rarely the kinds of engagements one will see elementals partake in even in clan space. They are much like predators in the wild. Once a target is damaged, or occupied, an elemental point may become the worst nightmare of any battle mech pilot. Beyond this, battle armor do what almost all infantry do, just dramatically better per team. They can latch onto faster moving platforms in essence to charge into battle alongside battle mechs or tanks. Dropping off in the heat of battle, or at a position to make an opportune ambush. They can perform most of the same activities. Unlike infantry, which are limited in their numbers of special weapons or anti-mech weapons, elementals come with powerful systems inherently, including one main gun arm, as well as, as of course, their mentioned detachable missile pack, and an anti-personnel weapon system attached to the left arm, along with their dangerous close quarters battle claw. A single point of elementals will be more durable than an entire platoon of infantry. It will carry significantly more anti-mech firepower than that entire platoon of infantry as well. In most instances, it will be more mobile, and it will not degrade as quickly due to it taking longer to knock out elementals. And overall, elementals have 55 points of armor and life between five of them, as compared to the 28 points of health that standard infantry have. They prey on battle mechs and tanks in the midst of the fury of battle, striking out against the injured and the unaware, missile crit seeking opened armored plating, or small lasers doing the same. If they can leg attack or swarm a crippled mech, all the better. Their auto rifles or light machine guns are also effective against infantry targets, and their melee capabilities are even more horrifying against such opponents. Where they may find their shortcomings is in the realm of a cost-benefit ratio. A single point of elementals can be as much as five times their cost in infantry, though more elite or well-equipped infantry formations may only be one-third of that cost. Still, for all of their uses in the field, elementals must perform. They are simply too expensive of an asset to be left to linger on the field behind friendly mechs or away from enemy fire. Even then, five full platoons of infantry, especially those with potential SRM teams, fighting a single point of elementals, 
may in fact cause catastrophic damage to that point in only a turn or two of direct engagement. No system exists in a vacuum, neither infantry or elementals. They are all components of an overall force, and elementals have a broad range of abilities that can have a major impact on the outcome of a battle. But just because they are superior to infantry independently does not mean that they will defeat infantry in an even or open playing field, or will yield greater returns than infantry overall. These armored battlesuits have their own role to play, and it is unique in their own right from simple infantry. They can easily be squandered, Remember to always use them wisely, and to not waste their potential, or to squander their lives callously. That path is the path towards defeat. To be an elemental is to be a born weapon. While mech warriors and aerospace pilots from the warrior cast are much the same, the Elemental is the first truly radically changed phenotype of human being created by the clans. With their immense musculature, their bodies were created for one purpose, which is warfare. The society itself was created for acts of low-level warfare and violence through their trial system, and the dream of one day returning to the Inner Sphere to conquer those who had allowed the Star League to fracture, under the misguided belief that they would somehow be protecting them by integrating them into the nightmare of a society which they had been built for. The Warriors are the focal point of clan society, and exist to ensure that that society does not stray far from supporting the Warrior caste preventing the humanity within from re-emerging and bringing people back into a more normal state of being. The warriors are the oppressors and the oppressed, and are denied the opportunity to develop their humanity, and only are allowed to develop their skills in the art of measured destruction. And by the time of the Ilkhan era, wholesale destruction. Elementals, to me, embody this most of all. Not simply because they are warriors, trapped inside of a terrible society that they themselves will perpetuate, who are literally born and rigidly raised to do this, but because they have been physically altered dramatically to play their role in all of it, and they will act as the stormtroopers of this alien society, crushing any of their opposition, and in the case of elementals most particularly, uprisings as well. They are men and women encased in armor, sealed away from the outside, and directed to kill their enemies on the battlefield. The same way their emotions are stunted, and in many ways are sealed away from the grim realities of their lives. But in a war zone, they are in no way deprived. These hulking figures are the most feared thing for the average human to encounter on the battlefield. And even mechs will turn and flee at their sight, especially at close proximity. To be in the wrong mech, unsupported, is to be undone by these demons when they lay in ambush. Once a vital system is taken, or they exploit damage which has already been done, they will pull the mech apart, before removing the pilot within, and crushing the occupant as if they were a bug. And this is just the fate of warriors, let alone the fate of protesters, infantry, or militia. But despite all of this, even among this society designed to strip people of their natural empathy, Elementals are no different than anyone else, should they be taken out of this environment. They are not dull or foolish. They are just enormous in stature, and are trapped in a system that makes men and women torture. And worst of all, even within the warrior caste, they are the victims of the very system they enforce. They are tragic, the same as the other warriors. They are prisoners of what they are, which despite their inhumanity, ironically, makes them very human. Thank you for joining me here today. If you're interested in Elementals, I'm going to be including a link to the Elementals box on the Catalyst Game Labs website, as Elemental troops are available in plastic should you wish to add them to your forces. Though if you do have a local friendly game store and you would like to collect these little toads, 
you can likely find them there as well. Or you may even be able to order them locally to pick up in store. But on another note, if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently and you'll be happy with the content, I hope. Also, a huge thank you to all the YouTube members for this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel, and I can't thank you enough, because this content really is only made possible because of viewers like you. And with that, I will see all of you in the comment section below.